Welcome to the Perspectives Podcast. It's Joe Sway here. As you guys probably know, I'm a believer. Uh, born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, attended the O. Roberts University, as well as Mr. Chase Brown, who attended the University of North Texas. Uh, he loves lake days, whatever that means. We'll get into that later. Uh, he's a phil- philanthropic creative. Um, and welcome back to the conversation, this great conversation we've been having. And on this week's episode, we have Nico, our friend Nico, as well as Raul. Um, Nico was the former district attorney um, in San Antonio, as well as hosting two different podcasts, one being R-rated Christianity and the other sidebar. And Raul's a great friend of ours. We do ministry together. Um, and he's also the owner of Best Bodies for Life. So Chase, what do we have on this week's episode? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good conversation. We get in depth in a couple topics specifically. First is kind of a follow up on the third episode of this panel series where we discuss policing, law enforcement and the justice system. And so we get into a little bit more depth in those as well, discuss some improvements and solutions that uh, we can all get behind for those um, institutions uh, as well. Uh, the last topic we discuss is, you know, how how do you love people? whenever you think or believe that their understanding of truth or reality is improper or uh, false or if they have a false worldview and so we hope you all enjoy and thanks for tuning in Welcome back to the conversation. We're joined here today with Mr. Nico and Mr. Raul. I don't know why I just called both of them Mr. Well, I guess I know why. <laughs> that wasn't really necessary. Uh, how are you guys doing today? We're blessed, Daddy. Thank you. Awesome. How are you doing, Raul? We're doing great, brother, as well. Blessed as well. Yes, sir. And we also have Chase. He's always here. I don't know why, but what's up, Chase? You're not, you're not Mr. Chase. You're just Chase. Yeah, he's just Chase. He's just, just Chase. <laughs> uh, I'm down with that. I'll I'll try to be humble or whatever we would call that. Less or informal, relaxed. I don't know. Go. <laughs> we'll go. go with it. Um, but yeah, Nico Raul, really appreciate y'all uh, coming back, coming back for this follow up conversation on the panel conversations we've been having, and kind of just bringing y'all on on an individual basis to really honor you, give you the space to expound on some of the things we talked about in the previous conversations and be able to wrap up this series and hopefully just put like a pretty good bow on it and have some uh, positive things we can kind of pull from this conversation. And so kind of the first thing we wanted to do, uh, which we we thought was fitting with Nico having you on, we wanted to kind of follow up on the third episode, the policing conversation and in that in that episode, we talked a lot about um, you know some of the problems that have been claimed by the culture and different movements going on over the past few months. And properly, it, it takes some time <laughs> to be able to try to break those down, understand all the factors. And so, in those, we spent a lot of time discussing the problems, but weren't really able to get to any solutions, anything that, you know, with your expertise, with your experience, you think it's valuable to get behind um, as uh, for the society as a whole. And so kind of the first question we just wanted to open up with just to follow up and give you all the opportunity. What are some things, um, whether it's some laws, whether it's some initiatives, whether it's just action changes um, that you've seen or wish have been proposed over the last few months or a couple of years that you think are reasonable solutions and would make improvements to our society that we can all get behind. In, in what sense? Are you talking about the justice system as a whole and interaction between people of different ethnicities and things of that nature? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I, well, a couple things. I mean, I think we should follow. For me as a Christian, I'm going to separate my faith versus the justice system. The justice system is predicated off of a concept, and it's lady justice. I think I said it on the first time that you interviewed me, Chase. And it's it, it, it's after the goddess Themis. Now, we as followers of Christ don't believe in Greek gods. Goddess Themis, back in a polytheistic society thousands of years ago, was the goddess of order. So a justice system brings order, not disorder, 
to a society. And everything on Lady Justice means something. She wears a blindfold for a reason because justice is blind. Truly, it should be, right? To ensure justice is done was my oath as a district attorney. And so are we ensuring, it doesn't say ensure justice is done to whites, blacks, browns, red, yellow, Asian, whatever it is. It's it, justice is done. So she wears that blindfold. She carries a sword because at times the justice system should be swift and harsh, like the death penalty or something of that nature. She puts her foot on the book because for her to implement the law, she has to have a command of the law. And when you put your foot on something, it's like you own that, right? You're, you're the victor, or like Captain Morgan or whatever that drink is that some people drink. I mean, you're putting your foot on something. And so she has control and a command of the law. In between her foot and the, Bible, and the book, the law book is a serpent, which is interesting, right? The universal symbol for evil is what? A serpent, whether, regardless of your ideology. And so the justice system should stamp out evil in a society. And then in her left hand, she holds those scales that everybody likes to reference right away. And that means she has to balance it all out. She has to balance out the angry mob. She has to balance out politics. She has to balance out all the different ethnicities. She has to balance out all the religious groups and non-religious groups. She has to balance out it all out in the media to come to this elusive concept called justice. That means, did we get it right? Are we accusing the right person? And is the result, the punishment, does it fit the crime? And so for me, I want to go back to Lady Justice. Wear a blindfold. I think we need to quit talking about ethnicity. Notice I haven't said race one time because I don't care who says what. There's only one race. It's just the truth. I mean, the DNA, you know, whether you're Hispanic, ethnicity, Indian, African-American, white, Swedish, Swedish, whatever. People can we can create babies together. So the, the DNA is the same. The melatonin in the skin might be different. The culture is definitely different, but the skin is the same. We've talked about that, for, uh, I think, two or three times ago. Other people talk about that all the time. So we're one race. There's no doubt about that. We have different ethnicities, and, and that's what I talk about, different ethnicities. So I think we need to quit talking about things so much. If there's a problem, you address the problem and quit painting with a broad brush and pull out, count, call people out for when they need to be called out. And if there's someone that's wrong, then, I mean, I've, I've seen Hispanics do things wrong, blacks, whites, anything in between. It does not reflect the whole ethnic group. It reflects that individual. Now, if you're talking about a gang activity, that's different. That's a group of people coming together to, to further a crime or to have a different behavior pattern. But that doesn't mean that their ethnicity is part of that. So I think we, we need to quit talking about it so much in the sense of making it the primary issue when the issue is really the heart. If you, when I've seen this over and over again, guys, and I think I shared this with, I don't know who I shared it with, I thought I shared it with you guys a few times ago, that the justice system is a social experiment. I mean, that's it really, that's my, it's my laboratory, the justice system. I see why people come in, why they go out. I see all the evil, the ugliness, the stupidity, the deception, and the good also. And I've seen people turn their lives around, and I've seen people that have what we call a recidivism rate, which is the repeat offenders that come back and back like a revolving door that we talk about in our justice system that is upwards, at least in Bear County, of 75%. It's high. So our system is not working. Back to your question now. What the problem is, is we're morally bankrupt. Instead of talking about ethnicity and skin color and where you come from and who you want to have sex with, why don't we talk about your heart? Why don't we talk about your mind? Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, meaning his mind, so he is. If we change people's mind and the way they think and their worldview and how they look and value our culture and the way we do things, we're going to change their behavior because our behavior is just a reflection of our worldviews. That's all it is. It's a dashboard to the engine of our mind. And so I just believe we need to go deeper. And every, every organization that I've been involved in, either nonprofit or the restorative justice program that I, that I initiated when I was the district attorney, every one of them talks about a changing of the mind. The, most, the, the one that everyone knows about is AA, Alcohols Anonymous. The 12 steps, they're trying to change the mind. They're, they're talking about a transcendent being. They, they, they've kind of changed over the years to make it whatever you want to make that transcendent being to be. But it was a biblical understanding at the beginning. And so you're not going to change any of those behaviors and those symptoms of your life if you don't change the engine. And so that's what we need to focus on, guys. We need to focus on the heart, the mind how we think, how we look at the world, what kind of lenses we're looking at, and, and not talk about the symptoms. Racism is a symptom. Arrogance is a symptom. Violence is a symptom. Promiscuity is a symptom. Substance abuse is a symptom. People pleasing is a symptom. They're all symptoms of something different, something deeper into the mind. So I, I'll leave it at that, and then we can go where you want to go.
Yeah, I was going <clears> to <throat> follow up. Um, I, I like that you made the distinction between, you know, you and Lady Justice, right? Being a believer and then just the social experiment that Lady Justice is. So um, along those lines, so for somebody who maybe is not a believer like you and I, right? Sure. And they're looking at, you know, this social experiment that is Lady Justice and they're looking at things that, um, let's say, whether it's coincidence or whatever, right? It seems to go more so towards people that are, you know, Hispanics or whites or whatever, right? In terms of, um, you know, the justice system. So mm -hmm. according to you, um, just this is just a general question. It's not really like, sure. according to you, is there um, anything that can be put in place Right. Maybe not as for, for believers, but in terms of the justice system, any any practices that can be put in place that goes towards making sure the lady just is blind. And I'll just use an example. Right. Um, you know, you, we've all probably heard stories of where, you know, somebody has committed the same crime. Right. Somebody has gotten, you know, someone was able to walk away with a lesser, a lesser punishment. Um, and then some people might say, oh, this person was white. So they got a lesser punishment. This person was black. They got a harsher punishment. Um, in your experience, have you seen those things to be true? Or what do you, um, what would you ascribe to, to why that happens? Yeah, well, first of all, it doesn't happen. And, and, and to, to have a one for one, you have to have a, a, a Hispanic, a white, a black, and an Asian all be charged with the same charge the same facts in front of the same judge or the same jury with the same prosecutor, with the same defense attorney and with the same criminal history. And then, then we can make that assessment. If we don't have those facts in place, then you cannot have a one for one comparison because okay. you and I both can be charged with a crime. Have you ever been arrested before? Just no. No. Okay, well, I have, I was arrested for selling drugs when I was a dumb idiot. <laughs> and so, and so I, I have that, I have that quote unquote in my past, right. well, if you and I both steal a pack of gum. I promise you, and no one knows who either one of us are. They're going to look at me a little bit different because I was arrested for selling drugs in that sure. when I was young and stupid. So, and do we have the same lawyer? Are we have the same prosecutors? Are we in front of the same trier of fact, whether that's the judge or jury? Then if we, if we look at that and we have all the same factors and then you're treated worse than I am or I'm treated worse than you, then and only then can we say for sure that there's something of a foul, that there's something we need to look at. And so we don't have that kind of data. A lot of things matter. Here's O.J. Simpson. Do you think O.J. Simpson murdered? I honestly have never really followed that story too closely to be able to give a, an, an honest answer. So, OK, well, I appreciate that. And I respect that answer. Uh, most people do. OK, mm -hmm. I mean, that is footprint in her blood. OK, right. so so he had a lot of lawyers. He was a man who uh, uh, that happened to be black and he was right. a very famous person and he was acquitted. And there's not one person that has followed that 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 case that thinks mm -hmm. he didn't do it from his behavior to the evidence. He had good lawyers. The prosecutors made some, some key mistakes. You had a witness that said something very stupid mm -hmm. that, that influenced the jury and he was acquitted. Okay. Well, what happened there? Here, here is, here's a man who happened to be black and famous who uh, from all practical purposes, it seems and appears that he committed two murders viciously, by the way, mm -hmm. and he was acquitted. So do you see my point? I mean, so where, where's the environment now? When you talk about systemic racism, Josue, because you and I have talked about this before, right. you have to define it properly. You have to say there's a system in place that is okay with treating me worse than treating you or treating me and you worse than treating Chase. And, and, and the system advocates that. And the system says, hey, what? Oh, you're treating Nico and Josue worse than Chase? Cool. That's what we want you to do anyway. Right. And there's not one out there that I've known. Right. No, 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 no. Um... Thank you, <laughs> you know, for, for those examples. So um, I would, so I don't, I don't really like calling it devil's advocate because I don't think I'm a devil, <laughs> right? So I'm going to call it being an angel's advocate. We'll, we'll switch it up a little bit. So an if, opposing uh, advocate. Say an what? Opposing, an opposing, an opposing view. You want to give the opposing view. Okay, let me give the opposing view. Um, so along what you just said in terms of the system, right, that we're put in place. So if someone was to argue and say, for example, um, we could see in the past, there was behavior when this was a reality. And maybe I'm not really sure when that shifted, right? We're not really sure when that kind of stuff shifted. Um, but you would agree that in the past, there was, you know, systems that were put in place um, 
That absolutely. would lend towards, towards that. Right? Absol- not lend towards. There was absolutely systemic racism in the past in this country. And it's right. a wart. It's a stain on our, on our soul. No different than what I've done in my past is the stain sure. on my life, but it doesn't define who I am. So if you were to try to tell me that my past defines me, if you're around my mom, she'd probably shank you and pick up an assault charge. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so because that's not who I am. Just like all of the, the crap that David did mm-hmm. with, with Bathsheba. And, and committed murder to cover up adultery. That, that didn't define who he was. He repented. And we read the Psalms, beautiful, the Psalms, and, you know, and, and how he repented to, to God, truly repented. And right. he was a man after God's own heart. And he was spared. So, so we know that, that certain behavior doesn't define who we are. And so I, I don't think it's, it, it, it's I think, just as, as, as followers of Christ right. to have our country defined by seasons in our, in our country's life. But to answer your question and go back to, yes, absolutely, there was systemic racism. Anytime you say people of color of, 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 that are happen to be black cannot sit at this table, cannot drink at this water fountain, cannot go to this school, cannot do this. Absolutely. It's demonic. Mm-hmm. It's evil. And, 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 and this country repented from it, thank God. And, and I, I like to think that we moved on beyond it. And people are trying to revive it. Yeah, and I think maybe going off of Joshua's question, because this is something I've, I've, been, I've been thinking about for a few weeks, and I don't, I don't know if I've really settled on an answer on it yet. And so it's kind of a specific part of Joshua's questions. But from, from your perspective, when do you think – and whether it was with the civil rights movement of the 60s or whether it was incremental improvement to get to a certain threshold at some point in the 90s or the, or the aughts, when do you think um, like America stopped being uh, systemically racist and um, things like that? I, I think you look at the initiation in 1964, the Civil Rights Act and things of this nature, that didn't fix everything. <laughs> but I, I think when we started making fun of it, and I say that, and I say that honestly, go back and YouTube Don Rickles and Sammy Davis Jr. and Mr. T when they used to do the roasting. Don Rickles was the most politically incorrect comedian. I think, especially back then, that was closer in time to when we really had the systemic racist issues. But the way that a society of honor and integrity gets over something is they make fun of it. Look, at, if you ever known somebody, my little brother used to be overweight and he used to always do the overweight jokes first. Because he had to make light of it to, to, to get past it or get, and make light of himself. Or I make fun of myself and my, 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 my setbacks in my life to, to show that I'm really over it, that I have a command of it. Fred Sanford, Sanford and Son, you guys are too young. Go back and research who, what Sanford and Son was. This guy was a man who happened to be black, funny, red fox, hilarious comedian. And he was as racist as you're going to get. Jefferson, the Jeffersons, George Jefferson, um, racist. He had his, he had his, he had his honky friend, Tom Willis, right? And he was married to a woman who happened to be black and it was a great dynamic. Archie Bunker, guy that happened to be white, racist as hell. And, and we, we brought, we, we made light of these things, not because they weren't important, because we wanted to show, in my opinion, as a society, that we have a control of it, that we command it, it doesn't command us, and that we've gotten past it. And some of Don Rickles' roasts, are just funny. And the, and the people on the panel that are people that are black are laughing their ass off. They're laughing because they know Don Rickles heart. And he was a jet. People adored that man. He was a man. If you really study his life, that really that people adored. And he made fun of everybody, Jews and, and Puerto Ricans and, you know, you name it. There was nobody that was safe around him, including himself. He was Jewish. And, and I, and I think that was a, I, I think the seventies, we really started seeing some change and in the 80s. Now, here's the deal, guys. We're never going to get rid of racism. We're just not. It's a sin issue. You're never going to get rid of murder. Look around. You're never going to get rid of sex trafficking. Look around. Or, or, or sexual assault or stealing or arrogance. You're not going to get rid of these things. We try and we strive and we toil to do that. We try to present the gospel with the Great Commission, go out to the all nations and try to make disciples, meaning students of all men, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Proverbs, I mean, sorry, Matthew 28, 19. We do all that. We try to be salt and light. We don't buy into false narratives. But in the end, we got to wait for Jesus to come back. We're going to keep on fighting the fight. But for us to think that we're going to stomp out racism, we're not. But we need to do our job not to further it and flam, fan, fan the flames of racism that had, had, had subsided to an extent. There are no KKK rallies anymore. They're not marching through streets. They're not having their, they're just not, there's not any open 
racist KKK people. I mean, there were back in the 70s, maybe in the early 70s, and some of our political leaders that are still in politics were friends with them. And that's that's between them and themselves. If they repented from that, that's cool. I believe in, re- in redemption. But I, I just I just I think it was more in the 70s. I was born in 72. And, and so I, I just race was never an issue. It, it, was, it was just never an issue. I was always taught that the N word was just the worst word. I, I still don't I can't even say that word to give an example. I was raised a certain way because um, because I, I, I kept it to where with now that I do racial jokes, but I, I'm Hispanic jokes. Lebanese jokes, I'm half Lebanese, raghead, camel jockey, you name it, I said it all. I mean, you know, Hispanic, Jewish, I had Jewish friends, I had Italian friends, and we, we had fun with each other. And we made light of our cultural and ethnic differences, but it came from a position of love. The intent always matters. If I have a buddy of mine that calls me a beaner or a wetback and they're, and, and they're busting my chops, that's one thing. I have some other guy and I look at their eyes, I don't care what color they are, and they're, and they're saying something like that. You know, I, I'm going to know where they're coming from. I'm not going to fight over that crap anymore. When I was younger, I would have. But I know where they're coming from. You have a mama joke with a friend. Hey, what'd you do? Your mom and your mom jokes for everything. And then somebody else says something about your mom that you don't know and that you know their intent is bad. Well, then we're going to have a problem. It right. always comes from a position of the heart, guys. And I think that's what we've lost in the society today. Let me, let me, yeah. no, let right. me pre- no, you can hop in. Because um, I think your question, though, and t- tell me if I'm wrong here. Nico, and not because he's the standard, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong, because I think we just went into it and didn't assert this. But you said when or at what point did America uh, start being systemically racist? And if I'm if I'm incorrect, I think you said this, Nico. That's saying systemic meaning through and through the majority, over fifty percent through and through the country was racist, or had the majority of the country's systems were racist. So. Are we saying that there was a point in the 70s before that time that the country overall, more than 50 percent of it was racist? Is that what we're saying? I I think what he said was, when did the country stop being systemically racist? That's the way I took the question. When did we start having this transition? Before that, we can go back. And this is a history question, Raul. When you go back to the 1800s and 1865, when, when, you know, when, when, when slavery was abolished, and, and then, you know, by the by the 1870s up north uh, and, and let's, without being political, but if we have to talk facts that there were Republican, there were men that were black that were voted in as senators and, and representatives in the Republican Party. I mean, so so you had representatives in the north and the south. There was two different cultures. So when you talk about that 50 50 split, we're talking about the leading up to the Civil War. I mean, you had the south, the Confederate south. They did not want to change their way of life. They had they had a different idea of what human value was, and and, and that men and women of black ethnicity, African American ethnicity, and color, uh, were, did not have the same value as whites, not to, and Browns and Asians and all that too. But but did not have the same value. So it was a basic human rights issue, and it was a way of life issue. So that's where there was truly that split. And, and six hundred thousand people later, who lost their lives over a very valid fight. Uh, shows how much we value human beings in this country because of our Judeo-Christian roots, because of that thing that we've talked about, that Imago Dei, that image of God, that, that we have all, we're all image bearers. It doesn't matter what, how much melatonin you have in your skin or, or, or you know, how your pigmentation is. I mean, we all have the image of God. We're image bearers. And this country knew that. And, and, and we, we, we paid a big price for it. Yeah, but Raul, so- I appreciate it. Go, go ahead. But we're not saying the entire country was systemically racist because we obviously had a large percentage willing to fight for it, black and white, both white, willing to fight for a sense of restoration in, in regards to racism back then, and Jim Crow law and everything that was going on in that time. There was still a large percentage of it that was not even in that time. So the country through and through wasn't systemically racist then. No, but there were systems, Raul. We have to say there were systems. When, when a school district treats people different based with off that. their... I yeah, with that. so was, I'm not saying the that first... the, the federal government, before this, the, the, the abolition of slavery, they, yes, the country had a systemic racist issue. You could, you, could, you could catch a slave and bring them back, and that was the whole issue over the Civil War. And w- what if my slave gets away and, and it goes to a free state? Because there was free states and there were slavery states. And what about that? How do we acquire back our, 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 our slaves? And there were slave catchers out there. There's a whole history here that we have to dissect. And I know it's not for this show. So there were systems in place that were racist. Absolutely, there were. And, and it, it was, it's a stain on our, on our 
on our country, no doubt about it, but there's a lot of great people in our country that said, no, that's not who we are. That's not our culture. That's not the foundation that we, th- th- these inalienable rights that are endowed on us by our creator, that document. And MLK said that himself. I'm going to screw up his, I came in to cash in on the promissory note of the Declaration of Independence. That's what he said. How, how do you do that? I came in to cash in on the promissory note on the Declaration of Independence. So he for sure did not believe that this country was in its, in its, its foundation was supposed to be a racist country. It had, it had a great foundation because they were Judeo-Christian in nature. And, and obviously overall, that's why I asked just because obviously the, the narrative that from different organizations that are advocating for diagnosing the country currently as systemically racist are obviously somewhat diagnosing justice systems and certain systems in the country today. And, you know, in the sense of statistics like the justice system or even the police department, which is part of the justice system to some extent, um, there was it at the the police department, which I think was part of the question, is systemically racist. But then you're saying through and through, although systemically there is more minorities in the law enforcement, um, I guess, field than there is just overall, you know, white men. Yeah, no, Debbie, how, how, you have to yeah, let's 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 be let's reason through this together as, as four men. So you. so just just wait. Would you agree that? The United States is made up of roughly 12 to 13 percent African-American folks. Yep. OK. And we've had a president who was black. Correct. Correct. And not all black people vote. Would you agree with that? Correct. Who voted a black guy in? Some white people. A lot of white people, a lot of yeah. whites, browns, Asians, reds. I mean, a lot of a lot of people voted in a black guy twice. Sure. And so what do you do with that? You can't ignore that. So many people that try to push this narrative that we're a racist country. We're not. We're not. Is there racism in the country? Yes. We are not a murderous country, but there's murder in our country. Right. We're not a sex trafficking country, but there's sex trafficking in our country. And so you see how we shift the, argu- the arguments and we identify and try to label things for an agenda. Our agenda as followers of Jesus Christ are truth scavengers. We're going to scavenge and look for the truth. We're going to mold to the truth and conform to it because we're obedient to Christ. And we want to, we want to advocate for him. And then we're going to champion the truth. And so, so many Christians that fall into this false narrative with this virtue signaling of trying to be good so they can, you know, say how crappy the country is and how shitty Christians are. I don't, I think, I think it's wrong. I think it's absolutely wrong and it's irresponsible. And I don't think it honors the gospel or our savior because Jesus spoke the truth to everybody and he pissed off a lot of people. He didn't try to, but the truth has a, has a way of doing that, right? The truth makes us all uncomfortable because none of us are perfect. And so that's why we have to be truth pursuers as, as Christians. Just to qualify some of the things you were saying, that was kind of my way of doing it. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And um, I have one, I'll say one observation to make and then one quick footnote. And then Joshua, I'll pass it down to you for any follow-up questions before we move to the next topic. Um, I just wanted to say, I like how you brought in like humor and jokes into the conversation. Um, It's something where uh, one of the individuals, he's a, I think a mathematician and a philosophy academic, if I remember right, his name's James Lindsay. I think both of y'all are familiar with him. He, he spoke a lot on critical race theory and, didn't different postmodern thoughts and things like that. And so one of the things he was talking about in a podcast I was listening to recently is throughout history, anthropologists have seen that jokes is one of the ways that we've worked through what we would deem controversial issues and have tried to find like the boundaries of the conversation and is a very good tool that we can use whenever it's used in a I guess what we would call a loving way rather than a demeaning way. And so one of the things that I I would, that I wish we could strive towards as a society and as a community is um, one, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to humor and things like that. Cause I think we've seen a lot of that with the idea of cancel culture and different things that come up um, and and holding people um, reasonably accountable to their intentions behind that and just asking questions of, you know, what did you mean with that joke and different things like that. So I wanted to add that 
I think another thing um, that I can just briefly bring up as a footnote to kind of your observations on racism in the country. And I think the quote, and you can quickly correct me if I'm wrong, saying, you know, we we have racism here and we probably won't ever do away with it. Is that, is that a reasonable quote from what you just said? Well, but do you think we're going to ever do away with it? Because that means, so you, I mean, so, yeah, no, of course yeah. we're not going to. Yeah. So I think, so what I was going to say is, um, and if we want to discuss this, like I'm, I'm more than okay with that. Um, I, I think one of the ways that we've been approaching this racism conversation is through the wrong perspective and through the wrong lens and to whereas instead of pursuing this, like, um, like wanting to stop as many murders as possible, wanting to stop as many of those kind of situations as possible. We're dealing with it more like a disease in a way where we're trying to like explicitly completely eradicate it rather than trying to find the the trade-off between like, Hey, what is the difference between, or what is this trade-off between the certain percentage of racism in the country that like we have to, we have to live with because we're in a fallen world. And on the other end, this, authoritarian policing of thought and conversation and intentions and things like that. And um, cause for example, like if we tried to handle murders, just like we did, just like we have diseases, then we would live in a completely authoritarian place. And, and that's not beneficial to thriving and life, especially how we believe to live here in America. And so the the fact that we will never get to zero percent mur- or zero murders ever is something that I think is something that we need to take into account and have a kind of similar approach to this racism topic to where we want to remove as much of it as possible, but also understand the the potential trade offs that come into play there. And yeah, so, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the trade off is. I mean, we just we, we're gonna we're gonna preach the gospel. We're gonna live out the gospel. We're gonna love people the way Jesus loved. We're gonna correct people. We're gonna encourage people, and we're gonna rebuke bad ideas. Second Timothy four two, I believe. That's a it's powerful. And think about that. Preach the gospel. Period. Not when it's convenient. Not when it's politically correct. Not when it's easy. Preach the gospel in season and out of season. In season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. I would that's, say that, like, that's very specific because not everything is the same. So we're going to, re- we're going to encourage fellow followers that are maybe just falling back. We're going to correct those that are open-minded and, and have a humble spirit, you know, to, to correct. And we're going to rebuke deception. I and mean, Paul was terrified, not terrified, but he always warned against a false gospel. A partial gospel is a false gospel. And then there's just absolutely false gospel out there. And so yeah. we're, we're called to do all that dead. Yeah, I think real quick, just way, and then we could go down to to you. I think, like I, I think for example, like one trade off that comes into play, and maybe I'm using the wrong verbiage, is is just being very judgmental and being very quick in judgment. To whereas, if someone says one insensitive thing by mistake and it, it is in a pattern of action, like they're still deemed as a, it can be deemed as a racist by some people today, and so that's why I think a trade-off can come into play where things can be dealt with a little bit too quick because we're trying to completely eradicate it. Well, brother, but we're, we're just scared. We have no, we get no cajones, man, in the church anymore. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, you know, if, if everyone's a racist, then no one's a racist. I mean, everyone's Hitler. Everyone's a Nazi. Everyone's a racist. A disagreement is a racist. Disagreement means this. No, disagreement is just disagreement. Just because you disagree with something doesn't mean you're a phobe of whatever it is. So they call us a phobe. I mean, I think Hillary Clinton said it the other day, well, Christians are, are judgmental in this. Well, aren't you judging me to say that I'm judgmental? I mean, that's kind of weird. I mean, so the hypocrisy and the redefinition of terms, and we allow it because we're afraid to be called names on, on Facebook. We're afraid to be tweeted out on something. We're afraid. I mean, Jesus and his disciples were talking about being beheaded and, and killed, and we're worried about being canceled on, on Facebook. We've got to lovingly but courageously preach the gospel in season and out of season properly handle the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, not be embarrassed of it, train ourselves up and, and arm ourselves and have fill up our quiver with the weapons of truth, and then work on our presentation and pray for wisdom on how to reach people and season all of our conversations with salt, meaning truth preservative. And, and we just don't do that anymore. And so we're so afraid. 
that we want to be called a good Christian by society. We, we, we strive to be liked. We worry about how many people liked us and how many people follow us and how many people share us. And we, 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 we strive so much on that that we let the world define what's a good Christian. And you know what a good Christian is? A good Christian means you, Christian, look more like us. You're a good Christian. And we're supposed to be looking up and saying, Lord, am I a good Christian? Yeshua, Lord, am I a good Christian? You're a good Christian. Says who? Says me, not says the world, right? Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Don't, don't forget if they hate you, they hated me first. John 17, 15. And we can go on and on and on about these things. Now, we're not trying to be disliked. We have to, we have, to have wisdom in how we present the gospel and how we live out the gospel so we're not a bunch of hypocrites. But we want to be authentic and, and share the true gospel and the real Jesus with people. I think and Jesus transforms people, not us. I think, Chase, also to add to what Nico's saying, and I think it's based on the conversation we were having earlier. You know, James 1.19 says to be quick to, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, right? So that I think there's a trade-off in that regard, right? When you have someone, which I think is what you're prefacing, that is completely contrary to the worldview, their moral standards skewed, their perception on how to handle certain things that are just antithetical to the Christian worldview. We still, like Paul with Athens and many other cultures he encountered that were just completely antithetical to what Christ was, was advocating for. He, he listened, and many times he was actually more educated than them in their own subject, right? He happened, that happened in Rome. And then after he listened to them, not only that, it builds a sense of contrary on their own talk because then he started asking questions that were very strategically placed based on what he was listening to them say. And then it was a perfect time to correct them because they start contradicting themselves. They start saying, well, I believe in this. But then as he listened, he realized, but yeah, but you also said you believe in this, right? And people have done that with the whole BLM thing. So, well, you said Black Lives Matter, but what about these Black Lives? And they start stumping over each other while a lot of Christians will start correcting before they listen and they don't allow themselves to actually have a great position from letting, letting the person that's completely deceived stomp themselves out just by their arguments, their, their own presuppositions, their own placements of what they're, they're advocating for. And if we just listen for a minute and don't correct immediately, they're going to give us just a, hate, just a playground of just fields to talk from where they're going to see just stomping over each other. I think that made sense. Hopefully it made sense. Um, and just the posture that we should take when people are completely just coming from a total opposite uh, worldview in regards to this kind of topic and these kind of things. Yeah. But don't compromise and be bold in, in that in that regard, as Nico was saying. When you correct them, you're you're correcting them from the place of where we know it to be true, and we're not going to sit there and coddle them, which is what you were saying about love, right? We 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 don't sit there and just beat them over the head with truth, but there's a way that we communicate that people don't feel like they just got pounced on but they were corrected and they realized they're corrected because they realize what I'm saying has no sense in regards to what I said earlier. And people start realizing, wow, I'm deceived. And it's what Nico usually says is I want people to walk away and be like, wow, that makes way too much sense. And I don't know what to do about it. And that's generally what happens when you listen well, and then you speak, if that means correction, correction, if not, whatever. But then people literally walk away and realize, crap that makes too much sense if i'm incorrect yeah. on that let me know no that sounded good joshua you have anything you want to cover for this before we move on yeah i just want to ask uh, nico a quick question and then we'll go to <clears throat> the next part um so i think last time we were uh, we kind of got into speaking about uh policing but but obviously we didn't get to talk about a lot of different things so i wanted you to give the audience just some you know according to you right whether you want to take it from your being a DA or a believer, well, I guess you can't really separate the two because both of those make you, right? Um, you know, some some people may say, um, you know, there's too many bad apples. We're, we're seeing and hearing about too many bad apples. Obviously, we know that there are a lot of good apples out there, but we're seeing too many bad apples that if they're all in the batch would make the whole batch bad, right? Um, so what are some, I guess, you know, because I know it's something that you brought up. So if you could just kind of maybe just reiterate what you said a couple episodes ago, um, what are some practical tools that you've implemented on the district where you're at um, that you think that you would maybe like, right? That you would like uh, to see nationwide that you think would help um, 
relations between different communities and police and, um, you know, keeping people accountable, like you've mentioned a lot of times, um, what are just some practical things that we can um, implement? Well, first, we have to start with definitions. So, and I know this is not you, Josue, saying this. This is, this is what you've heard. You're just regurgitating what you've heard. So when people say there are too many bad apples, why, why do we take that as, as truth? What do you mean by that? What are bad apples? People that are treating people wrong or they're doing, they're breaking the law, they're abusing their authority. Okay, then if you define bad apples that way, how many are too many bad apples to you? Tell me what that means. Does that mean 10 or does that mean 40,000? How many? And, and they won't tell you. They'll, they'll tell you the three or four cases we've heard of over the last you know, four months without context. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I got to wait for all the evidence before I make a determination. Mm -hmm. And so when you say there's too many bad apples, what are we talking about? Does anybody know how many, roughly how many police encounters there are in this country every year? Roughly. Like 330 million, something like that? That's 330 people. There's 375 million interactions with police from tickets to, hey, my cat's stuck in the tree to I think I heard something outside, to investigating in a, a family violence assault, to murder, to whatever. Around 375 million interactions. And how many do we hear about? Now, I'm not saying that the ones we've heard about are right or wrong. Let's just mm -hmm. shelf that for a second. How many do we hear about? G give me, well, can you guys give me a rough number? Mm, jo uh, like, you think maybe 10, Joshua? 10, 15, 20, something like that? I don't even know if you can name all 20, brother, and I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying yeah. you're, you're being very generous, but let's say 20. Divide 20 by 375 million. Mm -hmm. Tell me what number you get. You don't have to do it right now. 20 mm -hmm. by 375 million. It's insane. It's insane. And so we have to ask ourselves to go back to what Josue has heard. Right. Too many bad apples. What, what number are we talking about? I mean, if you have, you know, 40 people and there's 21 of them that are bad, I'm like, that's way too many. That's more than half. I mean, if you just tell me that a fourth of those are bad, that's a lot. That's too many bad apples out of 40. But, but if, we, if we've heard of 20, and I don't know, man, look, there's some, I held cops accountable for a living, guys. To, this is what Josue wanted me to get to initially, but I wanted to give context to it. I started a law enforcement integrity unit when I was a district attorney in Bear County in San Antonio. And the, the law enforcement integrity, integrity unit served two functions. Whenever a law enforcement officer got an officer involved shooting or was accused of something, we laser focused on it. I have prosecutors and investigators focused on investigating that incident. It was either we were either going to help exonerate a police officer or prosecute an officer and not leave them lingering. Because we are truth seekers, because our oath as prosecutors was to ensure justice is done. Man, where does that come from? Proverbs 17, 15. To acquit the guilty or convict the innocent, God detests them both. Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord ask of you? But to seek justice, not wait for it. Love kindness and walk humbly with God. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of courage, sound mind, strength, and love. So you put all those together, and we are supposed to be truth seekers and justice seekers and pursuers and defenders of truth and justice. And so that's why I started the Law Enforcement Integrity Unit, to make sure that we either help exonerate someone who is innocent or prosecute someone who is guilty. Simple, that, that, that's when something practically that I did. I worked with law enforcement in the community to create great relations. We had something in San Antonio years ago called Midnight Basketball, where a lot of law enforcement officers played basketball at midnight on, on, on different sides of town, east side, west side, south side. And, and they built up great relationships and it was wonderful. And I wish we'd started back up again. If I was still the DA, I'd be working to do stuff like that, community interaction. So people can see that, man, our law enforcement officers are regular people that have to deal with a crappy job sometimes, right. and, they have to, and they don't know what they're dealing with, and they want to come home like anyone else. And we have created such a prickly environment. Everyone is paranoid. You have people paranoid with police and telling police to go F off every two seconds now. I never thought of that growing up. I mean, I might have thought it, but I know no one ever said it. And then you have police officers that are thinking someone's going to try to shoot us because now it's almost a badge of honor to shoot a cop, which is insane capital murder here in Bear County. I mean, in Texas. I mean, so tell me how that's going to work out for us when everybody's just super, you know, sensitive. They, everybody's got PTSD almost. That is a recipe for disaster. Right. And then, and then, and we think that's okay. What is the church doing to bring calm and peace and to tell whoever's wrong is wrong and take whatever heat comes from that? Cause we're standing courageously on the truth. That's what a Christian does. Do you have any follow-ups on that you want to ask, Joshua? 
No, no. I mean, I, I know we had to get to the next part. I appreciate you sharing that. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, um, I know it, it's, it's something uh, just from hearing conversations, talking to people or just, you know, having different experts, you know, everybody's an expert nowadays. Yeah, everybody's an expert. <laughs> yeah. Um, but something that has been mentioned is just, you know, the relations, finding different ways. I mean, like you said, whether it's just midnight basketball, you know, that sounds like something that would be super fun in, in different communities, right? Um, just to let them know, like you said, hey, these officers are people just like you and I, and, you know, they're just trying to do the, um, their job to the best of their abilities. But yeah, we can move on to the, um, to the next part. Yeah, to the last topic. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, and this is, this is a question that we've asked, uh, we're going to be asking everyone. Um, we asked George in the last episode, asking y'all, um, in this conversation, and then David in the next episode, um, we we just really think this is a very important question to be able to discern and figure out the proper approach to be able to take to to these conversations, um, whether it's uh, you know the racial conversation or any any controversial conversation within the topic or within the culture, and. It's something that we haven't, at least me, I would say, I, I have not heard this question in other settings and other environments. And I think it's a great way for us to be able to share potentially why we're approaching a topic or a conversation in a certain way and why other people and understand why other people are approaching it a certain way. And so... Uh, this is kind of the best way we've we've been able to kind of articulate and frame this question is for and we want both like Nico and, and you Raul to answer. Um, how do you love people and converse with people when you understand or believe or think they have a incorrect or false understanding of reality or truth or just a wrong or false worldview? kind of the reason why we're asking is because we've seen people be on the extremes of kind of what you could call, I guess, this empathy or correction spectrum, where either people are a little bit too empathetic, where instead of just validating their feelings as being real and their pain as being real, they're validating that their understanding of reality is, is real as well, instead of being, instead of having nuance. And then on the other side, you have this tendency on the extreme to just only correct people, just say, I don't really care about your feelings. I don't really care about what you're dealing with in life. I don't care about your pain. And I think we could agree that both of those extremes are wrong. And so what are some things that y'all use to be able to approach those conversations, some tools, some tips to be able to just be nuanced in that and love them fully? Raul, well, do you want to go first, brother? I mean, I've been doing a lot of talking. I don't want to cut you off. You want to go first, or are you, are you being eaten up by mosquitoes still? Um, I got, I got some, some. Got some spray? <laughs> yeah, yeah, to help out a little bit. But you know me, I'm not a fan of putting that spray on, so I'm more paranoid. I know, brother. About that. No, I'm done. You're good. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think I prefaced it a little bit, and I, I didn't get any feedback from you, Nico. So I'm gonna take that as you didn't have anything. Uh, to say that that was wrong or not but I mean I think I'll use the example that all all three of us not Nico because he obviously is not there but you know all three of us go out and serve in the homeless community and we can all agree that about almost to the 500 people that we've somewhat interacted a large majority as you start talking to them and I can say this that the large majority because I talk to a lot of them you know come from a very distorted worldview most of the time not all of them are Christians, and if they're Christians, they've kind of conformed Christ into their own image. And as you start talking to them, a lot of them somewhat come from different perspectives and different experiences. But, uh, I mean, I've had people tell me, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. And, I mean, that's not a new subject for me. But the moment you I... You watching I, Nacho I, Libre or what? Huh? You watching Nacho Libre? What are they watching? <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I believe in science. <laughs> um... Well, well, it sounds intellectual, yet they don't really understand even what they just made, what they just said, right? And a lot of times, right. it's often what we're really interacting with. We're not really interacting with an educated 
culture. People are using words and they don't genuinely have taken the time to look up what they mean. To, to your point that you often say, Nico, they, that Christians use Christian vocabulary, but they don't use a Christian dictionary. Well, a lot of these people are using cultural words, implicit bias and virtue signaling, and I, I need a safe space. And they all sound good, but they don't have a clue, either the implications, the consequences, or even what they're actually even conveying, or even the people that started using those words, what the agenda behind them were. So all that said, usually the, the conversation on the aspect of balancing correction and overcorrection and too much love, meaning coddling to the point where people, you just, you just hung out in their emotions and their experiences so long that now you know, it's just, it's, it just doesn't feel right even going into the truth aspect of things. It's usually Christ did the same thing. He asked questions and then he just listened. And those questions usually had a somewhat of a perspective because he knew that if they had a fall, false view, they were going to start tripping over themselves the more questions he asked them. And by the time that they were done answering those questions, it was easy to just graciously and lovingly correct them. But you also have to have a subconscious cutoff point. If you realize that those people are genuinely not open to truth, if you if you realize that those people are genuinely not fertile soil, meaning they're not open-minded, then you also, you're, you're casting, um, what's that scripture, uh, Nico? Or you're casting seed Girls amongst the forest wine? Yes, yes, right. So you're wasting your time. You're genuinely wasting your time. I'm not going to spend time trying to share the gospel to someone that's completely high, drunk, and not even consciously listening to me, right? So I would say that being slow to speak, quick to listen, asking strategic questions, not to trip them up intentionally, but they're going to do that if, if obviously they have a false view. And then at that point, you can correct them in love. And if they're not open-minded, you're going to know real quick if there's a point where you just say, look, I can see we're just going to agree to disagree. And at that point, you're at a point where you need to pray for them. And you need to go to the, the, the macro aspect of things and you need to vote. You need to be proactive in your culture and you need to be sharing the gospel, as Nico said, boldly and, comp and without compromise. Because there are just certain individuals you're not going to change their minds because they are set in their ways and they're not going to change to a different point of view. So that's kind of that's kind of my answer on that. Well, I, I, I don't think we have an, uh, an education issue in our society. I think we have an uninformed issue in our society. There's a lot of education. Josue, you want to say something? I just want to throw something in there so you can answer. Um, it was just a thought, something that came to my mind for you and Raul as well. Um, as you're in this position of speaking to different people, same question. How do you guard your heart from being that, you know, almost in the sense of um, um, that knowledge that puffs up, right? It's just a, it's a Christian, Christian question. Like, how do you guard your heart so you don't feel that, you know, I'm just buried in these people? But yeah, go ahead and answer the way you were. Yeah, well, that's, uh, all that's great because without Christ, we're going to muck that up. Without Jesus, we ever the flesh will take over and we're going to screw every situation up. So I don't think we have an issue of uneducation. I think we have an issue of uninformed. So knowledge is not a problem in our society anymore. It's it's, it's understanding, and I've said this over and over again. Wisdom is something that we all need. We are lacking wisdom, the practical side of problem solving. Solomon asked God for wisdom. He didn't ask for anything else. So knowledge plus understanding, excuse me, gets us wisdom. And that's what we need. And so people are overeducated, but under informed on how to use that education and that knowledge. And then all this kind of knowledge, but they don't know what to do with it. So that's number, that's number one for me. And for me, I look at the value of people the way God does. So from, I am presuming something to correct anybody. We have to be very careful. This goes to your question, Joe's way. I mean, so to correct anybody, first of all, we have to acknowledge that we still need correcting. The problem with churches right now is all these pastors think that they've arrived. So many pastors, they don't want to be corrected. They don't want to lose their congregation. They don't want to lose their fear, a sphere of influence. They don't want someone going to someone else. They have to have all the answers and be all things to all people. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to reflect Christ with the Holy Spirit speaking wisdom through us. To, you know, the words of our mouth and meditations of our heart be pleasing to God, not to anybody else. And so I always start from a position that I never go into a conversation or circumstance thinking I can't learn anything. I, I can learn from anyone about any topic. And I, I am still in my corrective stage. I forgot who asked this question. And this, this will, I think, make my point. And it's not me. It was somebody else. I just can't think of who it was. When this person was asked, what's wrong with the world? The person answered, I'm what's wrong with the world. Me. 
I'm what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. You're what's wrong with the world. We are what's wrong with the world without Christ. And so we have to refine ourselves and continue to, to sober ourselves. That sanctification, there's a nice Christianese word. We are being sanctified every day. What does that mean? That means our spirit that communicates with God, our, our, our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions that communicates with the world, they're not in alignment. Our spirit and our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. Sanctification is when we're doing this little by little, every day, that spiritual compound interest. And when I can eventually try to get somewhere here where my mind, will, and emotions are reflecting my spirit, which is in constant communication with the Holy Spirit, that's when we are being sanctified. And I'll never get there on this side of heaven, but I'm going to keep striving and trying. So with that being said, I have, I, we are presuming that we're correct when we're going into these circumstances of people that are off in their thinking. I know I'm correct. Not because it's me, because I believe that that Bible is correct. I believe that that first century Jew was exactly who he said he was and did the things that everyone says he did. And that means that I'm playing long ball for an eternal purpose, not just for the God willing 90 or 95 years God keeps me on this side of heaven. <clears throat> and so I, I have to go in with my mind as a tool of worship. I have to go in with logic. I have to go in with courage. I have to go in with humility. And I use Christ, as Raul said, as my example i.e. the woman at the well. So we have a woman that by anybody's definitions was a very um, giving woman. I mean, she was, she got around, okay? She was in there, right? I mean, I don't know. You say whatever you want to say. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll keep it PG because I don't want to offend Chase's audience. You guys' audience are not R-rated like mine. But I mean, so, so I mean, you know, this is a woman that he, they're talking about water. If you knew who was giving you water, you would thirst no more. You wouldn't try to fill it in with, with all these behavioral modifications that you're doing because the root of, of your issue has not been quenched and go, go get your husband. He was a little sarcastic and he knew, already knew the answer. Oh, I'm not married. Yeah, no kidding. And the other guys that you've been you know, homing around with, they're not your husbands either. Oh crap. And then scripture says that they had a very specific conversation. What was that conversation? Can you imagine? Hey, remember you and Ralphie, remember you and Johnny, remember you, Johnny and Ralphie. Hey. And, oh, and she was so impressed by what Jesus knew about her. And it couldn't have been good that she went back and she became an apologist for Christ she, with evidence. She said, this guy's the real deal. And what did Jesus say? He met her where she was at. He showed compassion, didn't compromise the truth. And he said, now go and sin no more. He, he tolerated her. And that's a bad word, but tolerate me put up with God tolerates my stupid ass every day. He tolerated her, but did not condone her behavior. He loved her and saw her value. She didn't see it. He saw the way she was made, that Imago Day we talked about earlier. He saw her value. He saw her image that she was bearing. She didn't see her image she was bearing. And then he said, now go without condoning and sin no more. But you're loved and you have no idea what I'm giving you and offering you. And I don't care about the past. That didn't freak me out. No one, the Bible doesn't say Jesus said, I can't believe it. I do. Don't tell me. I don't want to think about what you did with those guys. He's not freaking out. God's not approved. He's not freaking out over any of your sin behavior. He's not PG rated. He's not G rated. I mean, God is just, he's dealing with the brokenness and the ugliness of sin. And he's not freaking out. This guy is battle tested. He knows exactly the way we're designed and he knows our flaws. And so I think we sterilize Jesus too much. We sterilize circumstances too much. People bust my chops because on the podcast, I use slang words that, of course, I'm, I know Ephesians 4.29 does not a, a request for me to say to your guys' audience. And that's cool. But when I'm doing Raul and I have done prison ministry or, or something else that we do, or I do halfway houses or I'm talking to at risk people or tougher, you know, kind of different audiences. I pray for wisdom. And so all I'm saying is I go into situations with reason. I go in with my behavior because my behavior is the fifth gospel, right? Gypsy Smith said that there's five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you, the Christian, you're the fifth gospel because you should be living it out the best way you can knowing that you're not perfect but trying to be a little bit closer to Christ, that sanctification every single day, looking at Christ as your example, looking at yourself as, as your gauge of, am I better than yesterday? Damn, I sucked yesterday. I suck a little bit less today. And I'm going to continue to try to suck less and less as time goes on. You go in with that humility, but then also courage. Jesus had the courage to tell her exactly what she needed to hear. He had the courage to listen and review with her all the crap she had done before. And he had the confidence and the courage to tell her, not go and sin no more. Because you have now you have this water that will quench all this stuff that you've been trying to fit with all your behavior. Don't look anymore. I'm what you need. And then you can go celebrate all that sex you want to have that is beautiful and good and enjoyable and you should enjoy it. Enjoy it in the confines of how I designed it, not the way you want to abuse it. 
Huh? And so that's the marvelousness of this wonderful first century Jew that is my King and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? And I, and I, and I had a quick question. Um, something you said actually sparked a question. Uh, something that I've kind of thought about a couple of times. Uh, so this is for both you and Raul. Um, and we've already had, you know, the race conversations and all these different things sure. to the best of our ability. So we don't even have to get into all that. Um, okay. So I've seen moments where, you know, somebody has died, right? And I've seen people that are believers, you know, they proclaim to be believers. So I'll, I'll take you at your word, right? Okay. Um, but what people do is they bring up somebody's past, right? So I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on those moments where, for me, it's confusing, right? It's like, how is it that, as a believer, we're bringing up somebody's past in a way to just condemn them, where it's like, can the same be, you know, said for us as well, right? Like you said, God didn't look at that woman and say, hey, you know, you were doing this and this and this and this with Johnny and, and all those different things. But I've just seen that happen way too often, and I'm always confused by it. So I just want to hear you guys' thoughts. And, and what, what, just wait, give me your specific example, if you don't mind. Yeah. Are you talking about us after someone passes away and this idiot talks about how all the crap they did in their life or, or exactly or, or that, that, that same thing exactly them. what you said the first the first time wow man what what a horrible show me in the scripture where jesus did that right i mean i, I mean I, what is the purpose on that i, I mean I, i've heard stuff lately that i guess ravi zacharias is getting his his his, his reputation attack now that he's gone and nobody can he can't defend it which what, how disgusting of people first of all ravi zacharias doesn't didn't walk on water OK, mm -hmm. he was a sinful man like all of us are. He probably sinned differently than you or him or Raul or me or any else. But right. I don't know who thought that he was the, the, the Messiah, the second coming. I'm, I didn't. I just thought he was a very wise man that sacrificed a lot to bless a hell of a lot of people on this side of heaven. And, then, and, then, and if all these people wanted to bring up this crap, then they should have done it when he was alive. Now, if it's true, it's true. But what is your purpose? What are we right. doing? Well, I mean, why are we doing this? So I'm harder on people that claim to be Christians I'm like, I mean, Jesus in Revelation 3.15, the lukewarm people, you know, not everybody that says in man, Matthew 7, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, didn't I you know, prophesy in your name? Didn't I heal in your name? Away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. Jesus needs to know us and we need to know Christ so we can reflect him. And so anybody that would bring up someone's past after they're not here, I don't understand. You have to get down to the root cause. What are you trying to accomplish and why? What and why? I haven't seen too much of that, Josue. If you have, yeah. it's disgusting to hear that because I, I'm so justice-minded and I believe in due process, which means fundamental fairness. I believe in the effect of, of cross-examination and effective assistance of counsel. And it's so easy. Everybody, I, I used to fight and box and I still box to stay in shape, but everybody looks good on a punching bag until you get into the ring and you spar. And then see how you look when someone's punching back at you. And I can't stand these, fake ass people that want to do a one-sided conversation, especially when a man or woman is not here anymore. And then you have their, their lineage, their grandchildren, their children, and their wife that have to deal with that without being able to defend himself. I mean, I cannot even fathom a biblical reason why somebody would do something like that. I can't. Mm. I, mean, I mean, I'm sure there's something there. I'm, I'm not going to you know, say, but I can't imagine as a starting position why somebody would conduct themselves in that way. Right. Just because I know you asked, I want to make sure I got the question though. So you were saying, what do we do with that? How do we handle that? I just what want to hear your thoughts. If you had any thoughts, because I know it's something that um, I feel like I hear a lot, right? Um, mm. And it's usually in regards to you know the subjects we've been having. You know, somebody may lose their life, and then everything pops up. You know, in the fourth grade, they went to juvie or detention. It's like what? Does that have to do with anything, right? Well, for, for like a for like a recent example, uh, like what happened, like with George Floyd being previously convicted of like a crime and things like that, like oh well, look, I mean, it's not relevant. It's not relevant. People are people are trying to. I guess let me. Okay, that, if that's what you're talking about, like that's let's, just, let's just yeah. talk about it then. So so he was treated as a martyr, right? I mean, he his 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 burial service was unbelievable. And there's, I don't think anybody disagree. I have not heard one legal scholar agree, disagree on the fact that he, that shouldn't have happened to him. I, I think his arrest was legitimate. It, sound, it looks like it from what I saw from the video and, and the circumstance and what they were called out for. Um, but the way he was arrested at the end or the way he was detained at that moment, I, I was even okay with pulling him out and putting him on his stomach. But I said this early on, that knee should not have been on his neck that long. 
Now, there's other people that are trying to argue now that that was standard operating procedure, that the, the department had said that's okay to do, and this and that. That is another discussion. I'm just telling you, I'm okay with his arrest. I wasn't okay with how he was detained, which led to something else, if that was the cause of his passing. And I say if, because I got, like I said, I'm just, I'm trained this way. I got to see evidence before I make a final verdict. And so, so what I think the, re, the, the response to that is people are trying to bring up, like, who are you honoring here almost in a worship manner? And why are you doing it? Do you really, what about that little boy that happened to be black, uh, that little white boy that was shot by that guy that was black? I mean, nobody heard about this as much. I mean, literally walked up to this kid and shot him in the head in front of his eight-year-old sister. Are we insane? A five-year-old boy was shot in the head in front of his eight-year-old sister by a man who happened to be black, not by a black man, a man who was demonic in my opinion, if he did it that way, I'm gonna still say if, even though the evidence is pretty straight, and happened to be black. That's his descriptive, that's not his identity. And wh 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 where's that? There, there's no, so to me, the Christian points both of those things out. They, 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 they call balls and strikes, they're above the fray. A Christian has to be above all the bickering because we're looking from it from a heavenly perspective and we call out both. But I think it's interesting that nobody had, where was all the, 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 the anger about, can you imagine, Joshua, did you hear about that? Did you hear about this man that happened to be black? They walked to his neighbor and this little boy's in front of his eight-year-old daughter and shot this kid in the head. Now, no, that doesn't no. make you saliva with rage, righteous no. anger, then nothing will. Where's that? Where's that rage that should be equal, if not more? If not more, that kid didn't do anything. He's on a bike in front of his eight-year-old daughter. I mean, his eight-year-old sister. Evil. And we don't call that out evenly because nobody has the, the balls to do that. That's where the church comes in. I, I, I stopped myself. But the, they don't have the balls to call it out. Shame on people. Shame on Christians to not call it out evenly, if not even more passionately. Sorry. I think no, you're good. I think the I think the child's name was Cannon. I can't remember his last name, but I think his name oh. is Cannon. Raul, you could go. Well, I think I think now I got some context and um, in regards to your question, Joe Sway, because yes, people do it with Trump in regards to his past, and then they equally do it with uh, Floyd with his past and and things that were even recent that were going on. But I think it's in, I think the context of their their reminding of his past is important. Meaning, if if, if someone's saying, well, Trump's not qualified to do the following, um, well, do what the following and why are you using his past? Now it's like, well, he wants to be a Sunday school teacher. Well, okay, I'm not going to say that he's disqualified because he has a past, but at some would look at the measure of his heart. And Titus talks about this and James talks about this. That's not that your past levels out who you are today, but your house has to be in order. You have, you have to have somewhat of a character and a posture to resemble that before a, a church that's broken and a hospital full of sinners, right? So it's not that you're perfect, but you're somewhat up, upholding Christ's standard as a leader. So I think it has a lot to do with the context of the conversation of why someone's bringing up their past. If someone's like what Nico's example earlier about, you know, Nico had a past and you didn't have a past. So the justice system is going to look at someone who has the propensity to commit a crime and they're trying to figure out who's, who's guilty. It doesn't mean that his past makes him guilty, but there's just a pre- uh, disposition to look at this guy because he consistently is doing these things all the time. Um, so it's not that all of a sudden he's unredeemable. He's not redeemable uh, or he's not worthy to talk to or he's not worthy to speak to or he's just the law's cause. I think that's where the Christian's perspective needs to come in. It's like no one's the law's cause. No one's unworthy of being redeemed. Even Hitler was redeemable in his time. Everyone, no matter what of their past, or de past decisions are are worthy of speaking to and ministering to. Um, however, if now if we're, if we're tending to the aspect of um, George Floyd in regards to white people, I think the conversation, and I may be misinformed on this, a lot of the people that I've heard talk about his past is more in regards to the fact that there's not an equality considering this whole conversation is about equality in regards to the handling of his funeral, how much funds, how much media time, how much all this that was allocated to a man that generally was not a saint. He got, I don't know if he got a medal of honor, but I believe he got a flag on his, on his casket, which usually only people in the military get that, you know, there's, there's, there's a certain sense of servitude and sacrifice of a lot of the things he got that people or even kids that also lose their life on a constant basis unjustly did not get. So they're, 
they're bringing up the past to make a point, not because the guy wasn't redeemable, not because he was supposed to go through what he went through, not because we still shouldn't have a funeral for the man. But in regards to their whole argument was about justice and equality when you're leaving a ton of people out there with a claim to make of like, hey, what about my funeral for my kid that was also black and literally was a saint? Uh, in 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 based on the on the lines that they're making George Floyd not because he was a literal saint but had no record was a good kid was black or white or Mexican doesn't matter but genuinely got none of that type of attention so so I think that's what usually that conversation is happening in regards to if you're if you're talking about Floyd and or even when they talk about Trump it's the context of why they're bringing that up matters in regards to bringing up someone's past Josue let me tell you you're right bro let me tell you this Josue I I never I've never brought up George Floyd George Floyd's past when I've assessed the situation because it's irrelevant to me because his past wasn't relevant at the time the officers acted they might have looked up his record and knew that this guy had been in the, the system before but I mean it, it, to me, it's irrelevant. I don't care about his past. I, I, I analyze the circumstance, you know, and hold people accountable accordingly. So, yeah, I, no. I understand your question now. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it was that. I just wanted to get um, you guys' thoughts on it. It's just something I've thought about, you know. Well, um, it, look, look where it took us. It's good. It yeah. Was good, <laughs> it was a good conversation. Yeah, for sure. Chase? Yeah. And I think we can go ahead and wrap it up here because I know we're a, li- a little bit longer than an hour. So, Definitely just wanted to say appreciate y'all for setting the time aside um, to be able to just come together in, in unity and talk and all of us just to continue to grow and provide this conversation to like our listeners and the public just to allow them to grow in their perspective and grow in their relationship with the Lord. So thank y'all so much. Well, it was our pleasure, Daddy. I, I just think that we need it to, to, I think the, uh, some of the theme today was this overarching theme of all love and no correction versus all correction and no love. And in Christ, we don't do it, but through the Holy Spirit, we balance that out. I can't stand that word sometimes, balance, but we know exactly how much to appropriate because we're called to rebuke and courage and, 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 um, and correct, right? That's a second Timothy four, two. So all that has different applications, Encourage, rebuke, and correct. So we're called to bring this corrective mindset, you know, Ephesians 4.15, to speak the truth, what? In love, not just to speak the truth. So many Christians go, I'm just speaking the truth. Yeah, but you got you left the love out the door. You're yeah. like a clanging symbol, right? 2 Corinthians 13. Without love, you ain't crap in anything you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it gets us back to this lukewarmness in Revelations 3.15 or Matthew 7, doing all these things for Christ without Christ. And we left Christ back in, in, at home base. And so that's this constant reforming. Lord, let me start with me. I'm, with, I'm what's wrong with this world. I humble myself to you every day. Show me what it looks like to put a smile on your faith. I want to be real. I want to be authentic with people. I want to relate to people through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to live out the gospel the best way I can, not perfectly, but with great intention. I want to constantly strive to be Christ-like, looking at myself yesterday to see if I've gotten any better. And I want to love people the way you do. And Jesus loved people harshly. He knocked some people out in the temple. He he told off the Pharisees in Matthew 23. I don't care what anybody says. If you look at the hermeneutics, he's using some slang words. You brood of vipers, he's cussing them out or whatever. He, he's bold, he's strong, he's loving. He meets the woman at the well, the woman that's being stoned. I mean, this guy, I, I marvel at the first century Jew, the historical Jesus Christ. I marvel at the life and how he taught, how he lived. And I really look at him as an example. And I'm never going to be perfect. And I know we're never going to rid this world until Jesus comes back of flesh patterns, of sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that's going to happen, but we should try and we should do it humbly, but don't leave out the courageous part either. And we got to stand bold for Jesus. We got to answer to Christ first. We got our no needs to be a no. And it's a full sentence, by the way. And our yes needs to be a yes. And we need to not distort the gospel. And that's what's happening. So we can talk about, you know, woke Christianity next time. If you want our progressive Christianity, which is it's a false gospel. Both of those are false gospels. And there's a lot of pastors that want to be liked instead of being credible. And I think that's the challenge we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we can we can see when we can schedule that. Because, yeah, I think that'd be a good conversation. Um, we'll be linking, Nigo, we'll be linking all of y'all's uh, information for R-rated Christianity and Sidebar in the description as well, Raul, in case anyone wants to get some protein. <laughs> we'll link everything for Best Bodies for Life right. in the description as well. It's good protein, by the way. 
It is. I, I've had it uh, a number of times and it's solid. So just again, thank y'all so much for the time. And yeah, we just hope like God, God is with you and thank just you. that we'll he gives that. you his spirit to, for y'all to just continue to be obedient. All right. God bless you guys. Bye, guys. God bless you guys. What's up y'all. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really do hope that releasing these conversations is helpful for y'all and just your processing of just everything that's going on. All the information for your perspectives is included in the description below. If you'd like to support us and the work that we're doing in the podcast, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe and just leave us a review. And so until next time, much love and God bless.